Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Matthew from the Impact Creation Group, and we're working with the Queensland Government to deliver a series of webinars on behalf of the Office of Small Business. Today's webinar topic is Using Partnerships and Growth, with our guest presenter, Lauren Cowburn from Embrace Growth. Just while we're waiting for other people to connect into the webinar, I'll be going through some of the tools we'll be using for those people who haven't viewed a webinar from the Citric Go-To Webinar Systems before. Your screen should look like this, a slide in the center and a control panel or dashboard on the right. This control panel will collapse automatically when you are not using it. So to keep it open, just click the view menu at the top and uncheck auto hide control panel. During the webinar, we might, I, we might ask you a question so we can better understand and improve your experience with this topic. We will ask you to raise your hand and to do that, just click that little hand icon on the side of your control panel. Remember to lower your hand afterwards just by clicking on the same blue icon. There is also an opportunity for you to ask our presenter questions. So the webinar can flow smoothly and we can stick to the time allocated. We prefer that we will answer the questions at the end. But please feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar of anything you'd like. Just so we can test the function of the, of the hand raising, can everyone just click the blue icon if they can hear me? Okay, thank you very much. Um, we also have some handouts for you, which you can access and download by clicking on this section here. Lauren has kindly agreed to share her slide deck with us, and this is where you can access it. Now, please don't forget to download these documents before or during the webinar as they've been specifically prepared to help you understand today's content. They will not be available after, for download after the completion of the webinar, so I'll remind you again upon the, on the uh, webinar's end. So now it's time to bring on today's presenter. Lauren Cabern is the director of uh, and business mentor of Embrace Growth. From Brisbane to London and back home, Lauren has experience in management, human resources, training, lean and Kaizen business mentoring. Lauren first started uh, mentoring branch managers at Shine Lawyers, helping them identify the root cause of poor performance and working with them to achieve, to achieve desired targets. In 2010, Lauren was appointed as one of the program managers for the transformation project responsible for the development of a strategy and implementation of a framework for Lean and Law 9000. She loves being able to support small business owners to take control of their business and achieve their vision for success. So Lauren, welcome to the webinar. Uh, thanks, John. Okay. So thanks everybody for joining today. Um, I'm going to share with you uh, some of the tips that I've learned along the way um, on how to build better businesses. Um, I'm representing uh, Embrace Growth and Snellum and Tom today. So just to give you a little bit of an overview as to what um, I will be covering. So I'm going to discuss um, some of the things that I've had to do during my career um, to balance business and life. Um, I've, also had to, I've also had situations where I started out as a sole trader, um, and, but then to grow the business, I had to look at um, bringing on business partners. So I'm going to go through a little bit of that today with you. Um, then I want to talk to you about business structures uh, because as businesses grow, uh, their needs do change um, and so therefore the business structure might also need to change. Um, that of course then um, creates a whole heap of legal essentials that you'll need to know um, and also maybe um, how you actually fund the growth of the business. So I just want to make very clear today that um, what I am sharing with you is not advice, um, not business advice at all. 
um, what I am doing is sharing my personal um, situations with you so that you can get a bit of an understanding as to um, you know, someone's story and the critical decisions that they had to make when growing a business. Um, I do recommend that if you do um, need or, or want specific advice in regards to your situation, um, we're more than happy to put you in touch with the people that you need to speak to um, and then that way you can get independent um, specific advice about your situation. So, um, my business journey, um, and uh, I'm just going to talk about my professional services um, business, which is Embrace Growth, and, um, and the journey that I've gone on, um, you know, uh, with that. So, basically, in 2012, I decided to go out on my own, and I wanted to start as a sole trader so that I could learn the basics of business, but also learn how to be responsible. Um, you know, for the actual dealings of the business. Um, so I started Imminent and, um, and and went out and provided, uh, you know, business mentoring, um, you know, lean facilitations, uh, business improvement type services. Now, one of the things that, um, you know, I, I guess I reflect on now, being a sole trader, was that it was so easy because <laughs> all you had to do is um, is basically focus on you know making sure that you bring in enough revenue to pay for the bills, um, you know pay yourself a decent wage, um, you know and so forth. But about twelve months into running the business, I, I realised that you know what I haven't done this just to pay myself. Um, I've, I've actually done this so that I can create a successful business. Um, and, and actually make something of it. So what I decided to do was, um, you know, sit down and develop a growth plan um, or a business plan um, that, that really sort of clearly detailed out what it was that I wanted to achieve. Uh, then what I needed to do was I needed to work out, well, how am I actually going to grow? Because in the first 12 months of having the business, I had um, basically increased the um, my workload, so I didn't really have very much capacity left. Um, so what I did is I sat down and worked out where I was spending my time and what tasks I was doing. And what I discovered doing that was that I was spending quite a lot of time um, on sales um, and also on doing my bookkeeping. So the first decision I made was to outsource my bookkeeping to a bookkeeper um, and then what I found was on Fridays that that really did clear up my time so that I could be back out in front of clients or on doing client work. Um, but then um, what I also discovered was that if I could actually duplicate myself then I could you know, start earning you know, double me. Um, and grow the business that way. So what I decided to do very shortly after outsourcing was started, I started to grow my team. And um, I was very, again, strategic about how I went about this because I didn't want to bring on, you know, like an admin person or, you know, or, or someone who couldn't actually generate revenue for me. So what I did is I brought on two um, productive team members that would be 100% uh, client facing. And um, you know, and I could build the capacity and the revenue of the business that way. Then what um, I decided was that um, you know I wasn't I wasn't the greatest at sales, but I had come across somebody who was brilliant at it, and uh, had a conversation with her about you know whether she could take on the business development management side of the business for me, so that I could spend more time in front of clients. So, um, so Maggie came on as part of the team and, um, and that's how we continued to grow. Um, but then in, uh, in 2013, 2014, um, my husband, he uh, sent me a curling and um, basically said, you know, that he would like to have another child. Um, for me, at that point, um, I was really hesitant because I was well and truly into growing the business. I was proud of what I had achieved 
and I already had four children, so um, you know, so so another adding another child to the mix just really wasn't on my radar at the time. Um, so what I want to do now is I want to go through with you um, some of the critical decisions that I had to make um, when we did decide to have our fifth child um, and the impact that it had on the business. So the first decision that I had to make was whether I could do it alone um, and continue building the business as a sole trader or whether I needed to look at bringing on some business partners. Now, this part can be a little bit tricky because um, obviously when you're a sole trader, um, you know, you're totally responsible for the business and, it, and it's fairly easy to, um, you know, to, to keep control of. However, um, you know, with a growing team of people um, and also bringing on business partners, you start to lose control um, of the business and then, of, of course, your liability can increase as well. So I just want to discuss some of the pros and cons about being in business. Um, so I guess that the key things for me um, have been um, that you only have yourself to worry about when you're a sole trader. Um, you don't necessarily have to be running your decisions past everyone else, which therefore means that it's a lot quicker um, to actually make decisions. Um, the other thing as well is being a sole trader, it's a lot cheaper um, than, you know, than converting to a company and so forth. Um, and it's not as complex um, from a legal perspective as well. I guess one of um, some of the key uh, downfalls of being a sole owner um, or a sole trader is that you can be really bound by your own fears. Um, you know, there are, some, there are certain circumstances where you might come across some brilliant opportunities, but because of your own fears, you might sometimes say no to those. Um, whereas, you know, if you have business partners, then maybe you can overcome those fears. Um, the other, other disadvantages, I guess, is um, I found sometimes it could be a bit lonely, um, especially when I was wanting to brainstorm, um, you know, something from a leadership perspective and, uh, you know, and I was finding that, uh, you know, when it was just by myself, um, you know, I only had my perspective. So, um, you know, that, that is certainly something that I did miss um, when being on my own. Um, so then um, with bringing on partners, um, it's sort of, you know, the advantages and disadvantages completely start to change. Um, the advantages are that you can sometimes have an instant financial boost for the business, um, especially if some of those partners are actually bringing in income um, or, or, or capital. Um, you also um, not only have yourself, you have an increased team of expertise that you can start to rely on, um, you know, to, to actually fill some gaps within the business. Um, and you actually have people that you can celebrate with or stress with um, when, you know, when you're facing different situations within the business. Um, on the flip side to that, the disadvantages of bringing on partners is it can slow down the decision making process, um, especially if you haven't sort of, you know, really thought about and discussed how decisions for the business are going to be made. Um, it can also increase uh, conflict as well, um, especially at the leadership um, level of the business because all of a sudden you're trying to manage and work with multiple different personalities. Um, so, you know, it, you've really got to think about, again, how are you going to deal with conflict, um, you know, and uh, how are you going to find resolution? So what I, um, you know, strongly suggest that if you are a sole trader and you're thinking about bringing on business partners, um, or, you know, or you are already have started a company but you're looking at bringing on investors or, you know, and so forth, really spend some time at the beginning making sure that you are all on the same page, okay? So I've just listed here some questions that you can 
you know, work through to make sure that you do have alignment. So, you know, is everyone passionate about the business? Um, you know, do you have values and a vision that align? Or are there differences? And how are you going to deal with those differences? Um, it's really, really important to clearly define the roles and responsibilities for everybody going into business. Um, I don't know how many times I've heard people say that, um, you know, in the excitement of creating a business, they forget to clearly discuss that. Um, but uh, basically, you know, when you, when you start a business, you have a role to perform and you have key responsibilities that you should be, um, you know, accountable for. So um, when you do have business partners, you've just got to try to make sure that you work together to, to hold each other accountable. Um, the other um, thing to talk about is how you're going to deal with conflict. Um, you know, disagreements come up all the time in business, um, whether it be, be because of something that you're trying to change or you're trying to innovate, um, or it could just be a day-to-day -day thing um, that comes up and you, you find that you're in disagreement about it. So how are you going to deal with that? Um, and, uh, and then what is the exit strategy as well? Okay, so really sort of sit down and, you know, discuss, well, when it does come time to either sell the business or, you know, or sell out to sell someone, someone else, um, how are you going to manage that and what are you going to do? So the next part for me um, was about business structures. So um, this actually came about before I um, had decided to have, um, you know, the fifth child because the performance of um, Imanex was actually uh, going so well that I had worked with my accountant to try to, you know, mitigate, um, you know, the taxation um, that I had to pay. Um, and so forth, and we had exhausted all of those avenues. Um, so my accountant had recommended to me uh, that we needed to start looking at changing to a company structure. Um, with a growing team as well, um, it was really important that, um, you know, the level of risk increases when the more people you have come onto your team. Um, because, you know, they're, they're out doing the job and you can't be monitoring, you know, micromanaging every, you know, every detail of what they're doing. So, um, you know, as a sole trader, um, you know, you have to be careful of that because at the end of the day, you know, you're going to be personally responsible for their mistakes. Um, the next one as well was, um, you know, feeding into that was the legal obligation um, so as a sole trader, um, you know, I, I was personally liable um, for any mistakes that my team did make. Um, and now that we were sort of discussing, you know, changing to a company structure, um, potentially bringing on other business partners, continuing to grow the team, um, you know, I, I sort of no longer felt comfortable taking on that liability. Um, so hence why we started to look at changing to company structure. So I just want to go through um, very quickly some of the, you know, the, the core aspects of being a sole trader. Um, so, so basically um, the definition of being a sole trader is as an individual, you're running um, and own that business. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of people um, use, use their name, for instance, um, as a sole trader, um, because it, it, there is no differentiation between yourself and the business. You are the one thing. Um, setting up um, or being a sole trader is very simple to set up um, and it's also very cheap. Um, and then why um, legally, um, what you do have to be careful of is that you are personally liable for any goings on that happens within the business. Okay, there's no separation between yourself and the business um, because you are all the one thing. So when I looked at becoming a company, um, this is where it all started to change and it became very complex. Uh, so 
I guess the advantage of, of um, you know, converting to a company structure is that the business becomes its own legal entity, okay, and the business is then governed by the Corporations Act. Um, you, you now, as an individual, um, aren't personally liable for the actual business. Um, if you become a director, however, of the company, um, you obviously have, um, you know, set responsibilities that you have to meet um, under the Corporations Act. Um, so, you know, it's a good idea to check out what those are. Um, in terms of setting up a company in terms of cost, um, it can be costly, um, especially when you have, um, you know, separate layers to protect um, yourself from, from the business. Um, so, you know, if you start looking at setting up, you know, trust accounts, um, you know, shelf companies, uh, and then obviously the company that you're going to be trading out of, um, you know, the bills can start to add up. However, um, from the legal, you know, and liability perspective, um, you know, it can be a lot safer to actually function like that. Um, you do, let's say legally, um, under a company structure, uh, you do have quite a number of um, different, you know, organisations that you have to comply with. So, you know, there's obviously the Corporations Act um, that you need to understand and know. Um, there's also the ATO requirements, um, you know, that you have to meet, um, and also ASIC as well. Um, they also have, um, you know, a set, um, you know, a set lot of requirements that you will have to meet in that regard. So going on from there, um, the legal essentials that I would strongly suggest um, you looking at, especially if you are moving from a sole trader into like a partnership or, or a company structure, is making sure that you have a partnership or a shareholders agreement in place. Okay, it's really important that they that, that document clearly stipulates what the agreement is bound by um, and what the requirements are for each person. Um, you know, you can also write in those documents, um, you know, the contribution uh, that each person is making, uh, what they're bringing to the company. Um, so if it's like financial, for instance, what are they contributing financially? Um, and is there arrangements for whether that money is going to be paid back um, and when and so forth. Um, it, these written documents as well can, um, you know, can be very useful in terms of if something changes with a legal partner, uh, sorry, with, with one of your partners and they decide to sell, um, you know, or leave the business, then you can have clauses in there where it's the, you know, first price of, um, you know, buyback of their shares and so forth. So it sort of stops them from, you know, from being able to go out and sell them to an external party um, so that at least you can, you know, as the remaining partner, um, potentially buy those shares and have full control of the business. Um, as I said before, clearly defining the roles and the contribution that each person is making is vitally important. Um, you know, not only do you want to be documenting, um, you know, the roles and the contribution, um, but you also want to be setting, you know, performance targets um, and that sort of thing uh, for each person as well. Um, so that, you know, like if, if down the track there are potential issues, um, at least this has been clearly documented as to what, um, you know, what the agreement has been, what the performance levels for each person are, um, and you can have that discussion um, if, if you need to. Um, the other thing that is really important as well is to discuss pay. So, you know, as directors of a company um, or even, you know, in partnerships, um, we don't tend to work for nothing. Um, there should, you know, there should be some sort of remuneration, um, you know, for, for your hard works that you're putting into the business. So how are you going to structure that? Um, you also need to make sure that you are complying, you know, with the modern awards. 
um, and uh, you know, and making sure that each person, um, you know, gets their leave entitlements, um, you know, that they get paid what they should be getting paid, and so forth. So there's different different pay structures that you can put in place for that, um, but you know, again, you need to make sure that whatever is working. Um, you know, works for everybody who's involved. Um, and then the final thing, um, I've actually had recently a couple of businesses where uh, their business partners have passed away. And, um, you know, so, so making sure that, you know, when you're going into business, you have your will and estate, um, you know, legally drawn up and, um, you know, and being managed because, if you are a business owner and something does happen to you, then you know you want to make sure that your family are protected um, and also the business is protected. So um, you know, so the will and estates can help you with that. So um, I guess you know when you are starting to grow your business and you're starting to move into you know company structures and uh, you know trust accounts and all of that sort of stuff there's a lot of information that you may not necessarily know um, what i strongly advise is for people to start creating a circle of advice around them okay and you know th these people can almost be part of your board of advice um, you know and uh, basically what you're wanting is to have a special um, a specialist in each field so that you can make sure that whatever's going on in the business, you have that go-to person who's going to be able to provide you with expert advice. So a common format for um, your board of advice would be to have a lawyer um, that you can speak to about business matters. Um, a marketing consultant as well so that they can help you to increase your brand awareness. Um, but also maximise, um, you know, your marketing campaigns to get good return on investment. Um, it's really important to have a good accountant as well. Um, so, you know, making sure that they don't just do tax, um, that they actually understand business accounting also. Um, it's a good idea to have a good relationship with your banker. Um, because, you know, if, if you are looking at borrowing money um, or um, you know, if you need to go and talk to, you know, a bank lender uh, in regards to, you know, tough times, um, you know, it's good to have that relationship with them. A business coach as well can also help. Um, uh, you know, I was talking before about, uh, you know, dealing with conflict and, um, you know, sometimes a business coach can be that third party, a mutual person um, who can provide um, you know, just a bit of perspective for people, especially if things are getting quite emotional and difficult to manage. Um, and then, of course, your insurance broker. So it's very, very important that you have the right insurances in place um, so that you're purely, um, you know, covered for what's going on in your business. And an insurance broker, you know, is the best person to do that because generally they're across, you know, all sorts of insurance um, that you might need in your business. So the next um, critical decision that I had to make was in regards to funding, okay? And with a growing business, um, that can be quite expensive, especially if you're wanting to introduce, um, you know, technological innovations, uh, growing a team of people so you've got added payroll, um, you know, that type of thing, or if you're wanting to increase your, you know, your branding and your marketing um, to try to get your um, name out there. So um, in my circumstance, my business partners and I, we decided to use our own personal funds. And we also, because the business was, um, you know, was running fairly well, we were already generating enough revenue that we could um, use some of the surplus in that to actually reinvest back into the business. Um, if, if you're in that situation, but you yourself um, are struggling with personal funds, um, you know, you could potentially approach family and friends 
to see if they would like to, you know, offer some sort of, um, you know, money towards the business or they might become a partner within the business. Uh, obviously, this is risky because if something does go wrong within the business, um, you know, you just want to make sure that they fully understand that, you know, that they could potentially lose that investment. Um, then the, the second um, way to find funds for a growing business, and this is there's a lot of talk about this at the moment in the marketplace, um, is government grants. So there are a number of government grants, um, you know, at the federal um, and state level that, um, you know, are helping small business to be able to get funds in order to grow. Um, obviously, they are quite competitive. Um, however, you know, um, you know, if you would like to do that, then um, you know, feel free to contact me, and I can point you in the right direction. Um, the other, the other types of investors that are out there are angel investors and venture capitalists. So, angel investors, um, they are very much people um, who are looking for a fairly new business, so not, not a concept business, um, a business that has um, an MPV, so a minimum viable product that has gone to market, is making sales, and the business is showing you know, some really, really good potential. Um, talking to the angel investors, um, I have heard that a lot of them are interested in tech type projects um, or, you know, or businesses to invest in. Um, and again, you know, you've got to be prepared to make your pitch uh, to a panel of investors, um, and you know, and go through quite a lengthy, um, scrupulous um, process in order to be accepted. Um, but there's no guarantee that you will. Uh, venture capitalists now they are more for um, well-established businesses that are performing really, really well. So, for instance, you might have, you know, your business here in Australia, um, you're operating nationally, you're getting really, really good sales, like up in the, I'm talking up in the millions, um, but you're now wanting to branch over into the international market, um, but you need, you know, extra funds to do that, you need industry contacts over there, um, and, and so forth. So, venture capitalists, that's what um, they can do. Um, obviously, the money that they're investing is uh, is a lot more than angel investors, um, but you know they're, they're wanting to make sure that you know their investment is within a very well established company that is already performing well. Um, so then, um, the third lot of funding options that um, you know that you can consider is um, loans and overdrafts and credit type facilities. Don't want you to, um, you know, sort of turn a blind eye to these options um, because, again, you know, if your business is performing quite well and you're already generating quite a bit of revenue, but you just need that extra that's sitting on the side to either, um, you know, invest in um, some sort of innovative product or, um, you know, just to help with cash flow, um, then, you know, these sorts of options can actually be. Um, you know, really good. Um, what you've just got to make sure of is that you can demonstrate to the bank or the lending facility that you have the potential to actually pay that back. So it might be through, you know, the, the um, equity you have um, in your assets, um, you know, the performance of the business and the profit that is sitting there, um, you know, those types of things. So upon uh, reflection, um, you know, of being in business, um, I guess the key things that I have learned is that, you know, I really enjoyed my time as a sole trader because I found it so rewarding. Um, you know, I could feel proud of what I had achieved and, um, you know, and that, that was worth celebrating. But as I, as I mentioned earlier, there are times when it did get lonely. Um, you know, yes, you can go and attend networking events and, you know, you can build your team and that sort of stuff. But when you're actually making, you know, some really critical decisions about 
the future of the business and um, you know where you're going to take it, it, it can it can be lonely at the top. Um, but then you know a business journey that has been travelled with business partners, um, it's instantly rich. You know, like you've got extra people that are coming on board to be part of your growth, you know, growth and success journey. Um, you know, they might bring financial richness as well, um, which will boost the business, um, you know, and take it to that next level. Um, however, it can be extremely fragile because life changes, people change, and you can't control that. Okay, and uh, unfortunately, when you know things go wrong with business partners, it can actually mean um, you know huge impacts to the to the actual business itself. So, um, so that is it from me. Um, uh, what you know, like if you've really enjoyed this webinar, or you're at that point where you would like to grow your business or you want to go into business but you're just really not sure about what to do, um, please contact us. You know, come and see us, have a coffee with us. We'll, you know, it's our shout. Um, and, you know, we're more than happy to actually sit with you, obligation free, um, you know, to give you, um, you know, a really good um, starting point, um, for, you know, for wherever you're at in your business. So, are there any questions at all before we finish up today? Lovely. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that, Lauren. Really, really insightful. Actually, probably provided us a kind of a lot of detail from personal experiences to transitioning between a, a sole trader to a partnership and what I, actually is involved in that. Um, there's yeah. a few questions from you now. Um, please feel free, everyone, to post questions in the questions section um, in your control panel. I will start off with this one. Um, if your business fails, how do I manage my partnership if I have any? Yeah, so that is where your partnership agreement um, comes into play. So this is where I sort of strongly suggest um, <laughs> making sure that you do have you know, some sort of legally binding document in place because in that document it will clearly specify what the terms of exit are okay, or you know, or what happens when the, the part you know the partnership sort of falls apart. Um, so yeah, so so that you know having agreements in place is absolutely critical. Yeah, and following on from that, um, Jess would like to know: um, is just a partnership agreement the only thing I need, or what other legal advice do, should I get? So um, yeah, so I, I'm not a, I'm not aware. So basically, what um, you know, in, in that circumstance, um, you know, I'd strongly recommend going and speaking to a business lawyer, um, you know, a, about um, you know the different things that you require. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, Frank like, would like to know: Are there any tools or strategies available to help me screen potential partners? So this, um, if you go onto business.gov.au, um, there is a wealth of information on that site, um, which can basically help you, um, you know, to, to screen your business. Um, I also have some checklists that, um, you know, that I can send out to people. So, you know, if you do want to get in contact with us, um, our email address, um, you know, it is on this page. So, um, you know, feel free to email us and we can send you out some tools that you can use. Awesome. Um, if my business fails, what will happen to the IP if there is any? So, again, um, if, you've got, um, if you've got agreements in place, there, there should always be a clause in there that covers the IP of the business. So generally what happens, um, especially when you go into a company, the company, um, you know, is the entity that owns the IP, um, generally. However, what you can do is you can write other clauses within that agreement that, that covers this circumstance. So it might, it might be that, 
if an ent if if one of the partners come into the business and they previously owned the IP, then you might sort of say that well, um, you know, the ownership of that business then goes back to that party, you know, if the business does fail, uh, for instance. So so you can you know you can document and negotiate those sorts of terms. Sure. Um, Justin would like to know how many partners is too many partners. <laughs> um, so, so basically, with um, with partners, so in some constitutions um, there is a limit. Um, so, you, in some that I've had, we can only have ten. Um, so, ten directors on the board. Um, now, with this as well, um, what you've got to be careful of is when you have multiple partners. Um, it can get quite complex or the business might evolve into actually, um, you know, separate business divisions and what you could do to, again, limit the liability or the risk of, you know, stuff going wrong within the business, you could actually start creating separate entities for those business units and then, you know, whoever brings a set, you know, specialty to that unit um, you know, they become partners of that entity rather than, you know, being partners across, you know, the one. So that, that is another option you can think of. Okay. Um, Karen would like to know, do you have any experience in international partners? Uh, yes. Yes. So I've had um, international partners before. Um, so again, this is where you've got to really make sure um, that you know, agreements are documented very, very well. Um, you need to clearly specify what the uh, what the contribution is from those partners. Um, now, you know, I, I've had circumstances where some people have, you know, like the overseas investors, because of time difference, um, catching up can be, you know, a little bit difficult. So, you know, again, what I would strongly suggest is that, you know, before you take on international partners, you, you sit down and you work out when you are going to catch up to discuss, you know, the goings on of the business, um, how frequent, you know, those meetings are going to be, um, you know, and what their contribution is going to be. Sure. Um, Leslie would like to know, do you have any tips for accessing grants for a startup business, i.e. is a business plan or project plan the starting point? Uh, yes, so, my, so a lot of them do ask for business plans. Um, so, you know, again, it, um, if you want to email me your contact details, what I can do is send you the links to the different grants that are available. Um, and we can discuss to what your actual needs are um, because the different grants, um, you know, obviously focus on different things. Excellent. Um, one final question here. Um, in determining uh, what partner you should go with, um, is there a financial decision or should it be surely be based on how well you work together? Ah, yes, yeah. It, it, needs, to, it needs to be both. Um, because at the end of the day, um, you know, yes, okay, they might make a financial investment in the business, but you still have to work together, okay? And, um, you know, you still have to be responsible. Like, so if they're investing in the business solely to be a silent partner, you're still accountable to them. So if the business is performing well, then you'll need to report to them, you know, and share with them how the business is actually achieving that and celebrate that together. But then on the flip side, if the business isn't performing well or it starts to hit certain challenges, because they have invested in the business, they're going to want to know what has happened. Um, you know, so yeah, so, so really do make sure that you know, there is some alignment there um, and there is a good relationship. Excellent. Okay, I think we'll end it there. Thank you everyone for attending the webinar today. Please remember to download the handouts before you exit. This webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Impact Innovation Group YouTube page, should you wish to view it again. 
Uh, you will receive an email with information detailing uh, the Office of Small Business programs and opportunities that are currently available. Now, thank you very much, Lauren. Your insight and experience has been highly valuable. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. And uh, we'll see you on the webinar. All right. Thanks, John. Thank you, Lauren. Take care.